I'm a 71-year-old man that's been homeless for quite a few years now. Where I'm staying at right now, I was, uh, I've been camping there for a little over six years. You have to be gone from wherever you slept before it gets light, because that's the rule when you can't lay down before it gets dark. I can sleep in the frickin' car. And so that's what we've been doing for the past couple of months. And I waited for him to evict me from my apartment and uh, I went to live in the woods. Addressing poverty continues to be a challenge in Asheville and across the country. At Asheville Poverty Initiative, we seek to address poverty through relationships. For example, here in our 12 Baskets Cafe. Hey everybody. Morning guys. How's everybody? Good? Is this your dad? Hi. Hi, I'm Papa Jay, Joe Grigg. Hi. Glad to meet you. I'll text him with you. Yeah. Look at that. Mm -hmm. It's a relational building. Walk together, eat together, share stories, spend time together. That's how we transform the world. I was working two full-time jobs. He was working, and we were still not making enough money to rent a place. Wow. To answer your question is that everybody don't serve God. So how can you make it better in life for everybody? All right, y'all. Y'all ready to eat? Yeah. You guys know what? We're so glad that you're here at 12 Baskets. Y'all know what we're about. This is about abundance. This is about not believing that rhetoric that's out there on the streets that tells us there's not enough. There is enough, there's more than enough. Food, love, resources, jobs. The fact is we're just living under a broken system that doesn't recognize the gifts and the graces of each and every person. That's right. Right here, we do. We can learn from each other. All right, if you've got something that you are proud of, we want you to stand up and name it. It could be that you are three days sober. It could be that you are your birthday. 60 days clean tomorrow. Woo! Let's celebrate that. I have managed to not lose two good friends through my crazy ways, and they love me and I love them. I have these two friends now. Um. All right, y'all, let's face. A hundred percent of the food that we serve is all rescued from local restaurants and grocery stores. The rest of your art is valued at that level now. Right. I am so glad when I see people coming in and anything that I can do in here, honey, I will do it. And I'm thankful to God that he touched the hearts of the people in the restaurants and in, in, in the hospital too glad to give us the food. And carrots. And carrots. There are just all kinds of interesting people here. Shannon and Andy. Uh, very clear about abundance here and developing community. The food is wonderful and that's not the main deal. The main deal is people caring about each other. This is my sister. She, she is taking very good care of me since I came to Asheville. I was destitute and now I have a vision. It was just a couple of months and, and Papa Jay had, had moved up to this area and and now he's he's there every day. He makes our coffee. He helps us clean up. Um, he, he helps host. But they don't realize that you've got to eat in between in the interim. They don't. I was born into a military family. My oldest brother died the day after my third birthday and the day before his ninth birthday. We lived at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. The police came and they asked my mom, has he ever ran away? And she said, yeah, he ran off one time. So they put him down as a runaway. It took nine days for my dad to get home from Korea when they were sitting on the back porch just about sunrise. My dad was looking up at the mountains because my mom had told us that they asked could they go hiking and my dad saw buzzards. And my dad was the one that found the remains. There, were, there was nothing left but bones. But that changed my whole parents' life. My father blamed my mother, then she blamed herself. And that's when my, both my parents became alcoholics. I was pretty much abandoned, you know, because my mother was going through mourning. I remember saying that I didn't want to live in a world without love or a family without love. 
And that's when I really started causing trouble. I, I'd ran away about 30 times, three months shy of my 15th birthday when my dad finally told me to leave and not to come back. way to go from here and that's up. Janet always talks about the haves and the have-nots and I think one of the problems in our country right now is we see is us and them. There's a lot of people on the street that you see and I would have, I mean I would have walked by them, I wouldn't have said hello. I'm worried about that. I can put some hot water on a towel and make it feel better. I've met them here and now they're my neighbors. <laughs> Come on now, we just can't afford it and we want something different. Yeah. Tisha and Joshua both have been extraordinary resources for me in just learning what poverty can do. Um, systematic poverty, generational poverty, what abuse can do. My dad was abusive to my mom and to all of us. What addiction can do. Growing up, I didn't realize that drugs were really rampant in my family. And I didn't know mental illness runs in my family either because we don't talk about things like that. And how that still does not diminish the gifts and the wisdom that both of them have. Well, I haven't talked to her this week, but Joshua, her and Joshua talk all the time. My kids, they're still mad at me for leaving, for going into rehab. She would have had daycare and everything set up. My daughter, she had come and lived up here with us for about a year, and uh, she was pregnant about two months before the baby was to be born. She was listening to her dad, and she left. And that's the first time one of my kids had lived with me in eight years. I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't go out around people. I, I, I couldn't make it stop. God, I hate when that happens. And I was poor. And I, and I was poor. This is the first day I've been out without him. Joshua all by myself. He's called me a couple of times to see how I'm doing. And they did the same thing to me on the food stamps. And I go, okay, how am I supposed to eat in the interim? And then it takes you a month to get them back up. I'm, I'm trying to get back out because now our car's broken down and we really need that car. So I'm trying to get back to work so I can help him get it fixed. I mean, they, they can always tell us that we have to leave and tow my car. This is one of the few parking lots where you won't see a no trespassing sign or no loitering. I couldn't ask for my car to break down in a better place. I really couldn't have. I pulled that down. I pulled the other side down. Kids yeah, are yeah, rolled yeah. up. We just roll them out. <laughs> Things are going to look up. They got to. I've already hit the bottom. Ain't nowhere else to go. This is a special place. It's a, a place where uh, we really are all a community together. I get so much more when I come here and volunteer than I ever give to anybody. So much more enriched in my heart knowing that I can be here to help. And if it means listening to somebody's story, crying with somebody, or I got your back, or Laughing with them too. Oh yeah, I love to laugh. That's my biggest thing. The overwhelming word that keeps coming up is relationships. Um, and I feel like that's what keeps us all coming back. Um, you know, everyone at this table and everyone who's not here right now, but like, you know, we want to come back and like, I want to hear about like Donna's son, like Papa Jay's job search. Everyone just comes together and we just care about each other. And it's just like, well, let's just try to see what we have, put it together like that brokenness Joe was talking about. I don't think there's one person that I've met that hasn't gone through something in life that it's either made them stronger or for a period of time pretty much destroyed their spirit. They're broken like a lot of us and um, we help each other put the pieces back together. Somebody stole your pack last night? Yeah. Oh. Baby, I'm sorry. That's the second time. I'm not complaining. God's giving me um, the earth. You can, though. 
Oh, Shannon, she makes me feel wonderful. She remembered my name the first time I came here. She always makes a point to uh, pat me on the back or something, like literally not. You come into this place, this place changes because you're here. And Eddie's amazing. He was one of the many I've seen the biggest transformation in since we've been open. Like, he used to have no one talk to him, and just coming in here, it's been able to see, like, oh, wow, my voice, and it matters, and people care about me. And trying to help him understand, like, yeah, we care about you, but you care about yourself, too. <laughs> you know? Thank you for letting me in here. A lot of places I ain't allowed in. <laughs> you always welcome here. Thank you. Just Thank as you are. Right? Thank you. Uh, Twelve baskets is the highlight of my <laughs> existence, really. I get to be around people and get a hot meal. It's different than pouring canned food down your throat. <laughs> it's nice to sit at a table and be around people, even though I don't like to be around people that much, but I know it's helpful. Yeah. I was born with every uh, opportunity given to me. I had a home, truck, boat, everything was good. And then uh, when I got divorced, that's one of the things just, I just stopped caring about anything. I'm way behind child support. At first my ex-wife was on me and police were on me and I got locked up for it once. And, hey, I mean, it'd be different if I knew, if my kids were going without, but I know where they live and I know they're doing well. She's remarried and to a wealthier guy. How long has it been since you've seen your mom? <laughs> my father, um, he will not speak to me. He has it for, basically since I got divorced, because he was very close with my children. My children, that's the other thing that eats me up. My son, he was just a newborn. I called his cell phone and he he said, who is this? I said, it's your father. Click. <laughs> so that kind of hurt and I, that's when I was like, you know what, I'm trying and trying and it, and it hurts. Don't make mistakes, don't beat yourself up. You have the strength to beat this. Yeah, I'm about to. Okay, you said yourself yesterday you've been doing better. You cut oh, back, you cut, you cut back, you cut down, and you're honest about it. That oh. takes a hell of a lot of courage. And Mr. Eddie is somebody who struggles mightily with addiction. For so many folks that struggle, it's, it's self-medicating from a life that has just continued to beat them down. I think any of us can look back on our lives and say, oh, well, that one decision, should my parents not have stepped in? Or should I not been able to sleep on my friend's couch? Or should I not have had my car? Or should the insurance not kicked in? Any one of us could have found ourselves in one of those places. In addition to our 12 Baskets Cafe, the Actual Poverty Initiative also organizes poverty walks and other educational experiences led by those on the streets and living the daily realities of poverty. There's no day shelter in Asheville, so after, after the shelter lets a lot of people come around here to gather and hang out. We call them poverty scholars. Everything's wet here, right? So if you have your bags and you don't have anything to cover the whole thing, then your entire life is soaked at that point. When my friends ask, what's a poverty scholar, and it's like, I know how to be really broke in Asheville. I know how to be really broke in Asheville. You, you just got kicked out of your house because you came out to your parents, right? And you are now going to the one place where they said, yeah, if you don't have anywhere else to sleep, this is where you can come sleep. And then because of what you identify as, as a human being, they tell you you can't sleep there. Zoe, you have anything? I know what it is to be stigmatized and thrown out on the street, and it's not fun. When I was growing up, my parents knew that I was gay. Up until the 70s, being gay was considered a mental illness. My mom and my dad decided, we're going to send you to the psychiatric clinic. And they took me to a room, and there was a table, and they said, this is where you give electric shock, where it changes you. And either you buy this and take this treatment or change. I said, okay, I was scared straight. So I started living as a boy. I wanted to be out, but I knew I had to hide it. So I hid it by taking drugs and alcohol. It was suppressing that. To have your stories, your faces, your friendship in their pockets when 
they're having conversations with their social networks. Right. We have about 20 minutes where you're going to be with a poverty scholar and poverty scholar you're going to be talking about that specific issue right. with this group. Um, there's only one bus that comes by every hour I believe. If you're a mile away from a bus stop on a day when it's raining like this, you're pretty yeah. stranded. Being food stamps on 195 a month, you got to be really careful what you get, so it pays to really shop. You know, soup kitchens around town, they process you through like a herd. Yeah. You know, at 12 baskets, you know, have you been there? <laughs> okay, well, yeah. You know, you sit there and you just enjoy talking to people, being served. It helps a lot, you know, for your psyche. I've been homeless for three years. I'm a whistleblower, and because of that, I can't get hired by any corporation. Most people don't have a clue about what homelessness is. How was that? Was it good stuff, helpful? It was mm -hmm. great. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's, that's what we hope this time is, a time to really just really get into the nitty gritty of what these big issues that we hear on the TV and on the radio and everybody's talking about, what does that look like locally with folks we know? So that's what we want to do, is to just get the chance to kind of say, hey, this is a situation, this isn't a person's worth. I think the most creative program is their Poverty Scholar program. They are people who've experienced homelessness and they know what it's like and they are brilliant about it. Okay, thank you. We could not do this without partnerships of restaurants, of Morrison Healthcare, of the hospitals. India Garden and Mela, we pick up when their buffet closes. Mm -hmm. So we have to be there at three o'clock. We're glad we're doing that to help people can have a food. How enthusiastic they are whenever I walk in the door. I mean, it, that's another new community that's been formed. I've only been here what, three weeks and I, it's already changed my life. Having conversations with people and realizing that having conversations and, and just walking with people is what my passion in life is. So we have six, and then so Fran, if you want to serve. One of the things I've learned in life is the leadership is so important to a place, and the atmosphere and the expectations that she brings into 12 Baskets really makes 12 Baskets what it is. I don't see how you do it. We, we pray and we beg a lot. It's important to her and to everyone else that everyone's treated with respect and dignity, and that's what we do here. Well, do you feel safe where you're at? Yeah. Okay. It's okay, yeah. It's all right. I'm hanging in there. I gotta go to court next week. What grounds me in this work, and it calls me, my faith. Um, and I think that comes from, from a place of, of wrestling with my faith and who I am. I know what it means to be told God doesn't love me because of who I am. The biggest struggle for me was I was trying to reconcile my faith with my sexual orientation. I was raised to believe that that was a sin and that I was going to go to hell if I couldn't get rid of it. Uh, so I can remember many, many nights just on my knees praying, crying, God change me. That's what happens when you graduate from Duke. So, That's what happens when you go to college, <laughs> And so I went to divinity school in the hopes of graduation, I would either be changed or I would find a path to, to be able to stay in my faith and be who I am. I, I have two Tisha knows how to hurt me. me. Probably the hardest three years of my life, but three of the best, because it gave me a foundation on which I do this work. That's why we need you. I'm just saying. How you doing, sir? You doing all right? To sit with people and to just peel off everything that they've heard and everything that they think they see when they look in the mirror and to remember together that they are beautiful and that God loves them. Dear Mr. Thomas, what can I get you? Uh, I'm trying to eat, eat brown sauce and things. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Thomas is somebody who I just smile every time he walks through the cafe doors. He's another example of what consistent poverty can do to a human spirit and not by his own hands. I grew up in a home where there was no supervision. Grandma died young. Before I was 11 years old, I'd been in every liquor house in three counties, all with my mom, all with my uncle, and all my friends was adults. I didn't know no children. I knew all adults. I've seen them do their drinking and fighting. And the first, in fact, the first two things that my mom ever gave me was two ice picks and told me to, to use them. And that's when I suppose it all started. You're either going to be a dog or you're going to be a biscuit, you know, and I chose to be a dog. I took lives. I did other things that I shouldn't have been doing. It's all coming back to haunt us now, which is the background check, meaning you can't get a job, places you can't find to live. I thought I'd pay my debt to society, but society is, is not very forgiving. I found a room that was for $200, and it got snapped up before I could even respond. It was already gone. You were the first person I thought or two, I know. He kind of camps out in a specific area, and he's he's kind of the leader of that, that camp area. He he wants to be sure that people are doing the, taking care of each other. He wants to be sure that people are taking care of themselves. But over the past five months, we've accumulated a lot of squatters. Why are you gone during the daytime? They stealing everything you got in your tent. They get drunk and they want to fight, and you don't want no part of this. Everybody that lives out here watches out. Like if I'm here, I'll make somebody walks down the track that we don't know. You know, I'll ask them their business. Weeks ago, the people that lived over there, they had some stuff stolen, and then somebody stole my food. You got people up and down the railroad track, up and down the river. You don't know who these people are. You don't know who's going to come in there and kill you at night and keep right on going. I'm, I'm thinking about the end result, you know. And like, laying in that tent for four or five days dead without anybody knowing it. Is it right to have hundreds camped under bridges? Not eating, but being eaten by hunger. Not knowing when they will feed their child neck, what job they will be able to ensnare. These people are just as important as millionaires. Poverty, a cold night in Pritchard Park, a hot meal at a shelter, a glare and a stare, an opposite sidewalk, a window rolled up, locks clicking, a purse grabbed tighter. There was a lot said about just treating them as a person and like looking them in the eye and talking to them can like really have an impact. One of the people had been living with his family and like everything was fine and then a close like loved one, regard like family or not, died and that had like a really big, big impact on him and so he got like kind of kicked out and like moved in with a friend. There like was this one guy who I was talking to and he had like a job, he was like doing well in life and one thing happened in his job where he um, told on one of his bosses or something along that line and it like completely ruined his career. He was like doing fine, have, had a great life and then all of a sudden things can just like crash down around you. Even if they're like sitting on the curb drinking, like there is a reason for that. You don't know who they were before, or, like who they are now. And so now you guys are the teachers. That's just so cool. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts for you guys to do exactly what you just did up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And to... I was very impressed. I mean, you guys, you nailed it. And it gives me a, a warm place in my heart to know that the next generation has the social consciousness to do what you do. That's for real. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. You guys keep sharing your truth. All right. Okay. Being a poverty scholar is not only enlightening, but enriching for my own self gives me the opportunity to make a impact. The good and the bad. Well, listen, you ain't the only one. We all got it. Exactly. I feel like I've become more of a whole person than just because of, you know, 
20, 30 minute conversations I've had with people on any given day. I come here a lot and I, I want to be here. It's not um, because just the need because I get it filled when I come here also. All right, yo, y'all ready to eat? Yeah. All right. Well, y'all know this is 12 Baskets. This is the place where we come because there is an abundance. 12 Baskets comes from the story of the loaves and the fishes. And we're just operating in a system that doesn't get it out. How Jesus inspired folks to pull from their pockets and share. When everybody did that, there was so much. Everybody had their fill, and there were still 12 baskets left over. But I was just married. <laughs> With these conversations that we have, it's, it's communion. If we're having it around table and we're breaking bread together, that's what Jesus invited us to do when he talked about communion. Already collected. We all coming together as one. We all looking out for each other. We are, we are, I think this is the greatest thing. Twelve Baskets is a place where all those socioeconomic divisions and barriers that divide us day in and day out as human beings suddenly falls down and people open up to a whole new way of being together in compassion and love. And that is what for me is a kingdom moment. <laughs> Kairos West, 12 Baskets Cafe, we seek to build back that fabric of home, what home offers to people who um, for myself, because I need that, and for my daughter, because she needs that, and for community members that are forcibly displaced, either culturally or actually physically through gentrification, through lack of housing, through economic inequity, so that we can then do the work of building the capacity of the community to thrive for everyone. <laughs> We came on an orientation day and heard about the goal of this organization as being equals serving equals. That we all have something to share and we all have something to learn, you know, things that we need. I realize that I have a lot of needs too, like the need to belong, the need to feel safe, and, and I do here. My daughter, she loves being here. When I helped out here, it was fun. I like meeting new people. And I also see it as a huge gift because I can example to her what I mean by all those words I say, you know, about about people on the street being our equal. They just have a different story. Margie, you're here. In the early stages, I, I wondered whether it worked, but I, I now I know it's it's phenomenal. <laughs> to know me is to love me. <laughs> I must be a hell of a cat. I think a kind of model that could be taken nationwide. And anyone seeing this, and like, oh, I wish I could do that in my neighborhood. Yeah. You can. <laughs> it's really, it's easy. It says, come to the feast. There's always room for one more, and there's all you can eat. You can take some to go, gather all you can go. Go spread the feast. Go spread the feast.